it's, it's a difficult question, and it's not really a question I've enjoyed wrestling with, because some, some questions are harder than others. Um, and I'm very indebted to um, a, a talk um, from the Libri Ideas Library by Wade Bradshaw um, called uh, Are We Better Than God? Is God Angry? Um, so I'm, I'm using a little bit of his material this, this morning. Um, but my starting point today is that God reveals himself through scripture. It is the principal way we know who he is. So when we pick up this book, we've got to ask the question, what is God revealing about himself? And sometimes we read it and go, hmm. So go to the next slide there, please, Ben. Thank you. Um, so other people have read this book and come to some conclusions about God. So God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, P a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic racist, infant, infant, uh, don't, can't say that, thank you, um, genocidal, phidocidal, pe uh, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, benevolent bully, you know, a whole bunch of really nasty words. Wow. And you look at that and you go, how do I answer a man who's read this and has seen that? And then you turn to the book of Nahum <laughs> and it starts, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Eclashite, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. So is Richard Dawkins right? Is God jealous and proud of it? Is he all those horrible things? And I was going to read you the book of Nineveh now, but I think I'll do it a little bit later. Um, because I think in order to understand Nahum, we also need to appreciate where Nineveh was, who Nahum was, and the circumstances around the book. So I'm going to do a very little brief uh, discussion around the history, um, and then we'll come back to what does Nahum say to us. Because it ha if, if, if what I, th I believe is right, then God is revealed through this book of Nahum. So Nahum is a prophet, right? And prophets is interesting because it generally, it's a, um, a vision or a word that is sent to people about a future event. Now, prophecy tells stuff about the way God controls nature and also the way God controls history. Now, that's, that's a whole topic on its own, and I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to state that. But what, what is important is to realize that Nahum was a historical man. He lived. He exists. Um, there are historical, extra-biblical records about him. Um, and that Nineveh is a historical place. It exists. If you go to the British Museum, there's lots of stuff in there from Nineveh. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a bit. So let's, let's go to the next slide and have a look and see where Nineveh is. Uh, I realize this is a bit small, but I've tried to helpfully add some uh, bright red arrows um, to help us see. So this is the Fertile Crescent this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, so clearly a reputable source. Um, and it, it describes the Fertile Crescent in the times of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Now, that was in a period of around about um, the Assyrians, sort of from about 900 BC to about 600 BC, that sort of uh, period of time. And um, Nineveh is that top arrow up there, sort of on the, on the far side. So, and then Nahum and Israel is the, the other little arrow on, on the left. So, um, not that close together, but close enough. You know. So, the thing about Nineveh is, I don't know about you, but it rings a bell. Does it ring a bell with you? Who's heard of Nineveh? Yeah, couple, couple? Where have you heard Nineveh, Nineveh from? Nineveh? Where have you heard about Nineveh from? Jonah, next slide please, Ben. 
so th there's this famous story that we tell kids in, in, in Sunday school about a lot because it's, it's got to do with a, with, a, with a prophet and a fish and it's, it seems like a good, good story. Um, and in, it's interesting, I was looking for pictures of Jonah and the whale and there's lots and lots of coloring in book pages because clearly it's a story that we t tell children because it's a, it's a kid's story. But actually it's not really a kid's story. Um, Jonah, interestingly enough, preached to Nineveh because God said, their wickedness has come to me and you must go tell them about it. And, and Jonah was like, mm, no, not going to do that. Um, and that's, that's why he went and he ran away and got swallowed by a whale and all this. But I'm not preaching on Jonah, so I must um, restrain myself. Um, so why did Jonah not want to talk to Nineveh? Um, and this has got to do with the people that lived in Nineveh. And so Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Now the Assyrians were quite um, powerful people, um, quite uh, um, had a, a reputation for not being particularly nice to those who, who they conquered, um, and they were quite a violent people. Um, so to give you a little bit of perspective about Jonah and Nahum and, and where all this happens, is, is to then talk a little bit about the history of Israel and, and the political things that were happening at the time. So I've got another sort of slightly academic picture. So Ben, yep, thank you. We had some trouble with the slide earlier, so I c I'm afraid I don't have any, any nice arrows on the slide at the moment. But what it, this picture shows is on the left-hand side, it's all the kings of Judah. And on the right-hand side, it's the kings of Israel. Now, to put you in, in, in sort of a... Uh, context of the biblical times. Do you remember King David? He was the first, well, Saul was the first king, but King David really was the, the, the main king of Israel. His son Solomon was the next king, and then the, the sons after that, they, they fought, and the kingdom was split in half. So, and they never were recombined again. Now, the, the, the ten, ten tribes of Israel were part of the northern kingdom. So, uh, remember that picture? So, Nineveh's in the north, um, but Judah is in the south, so the southern kingdoms. So the southern kingdoms are all the yellow ones down the side, and the, the green ones are the, 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 the northern kingdoms. Now the northern kingdoms had a series of really, really wicked kings. They did some really bad stuff, and, and um, God had told them again and again and again, if you continue this way, um, you, will, you will go into exile. And sure enough, that red bar in the middle is when the Assyrians came and basically ransacked all of the northern kingdoms of Israel. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll read you a quote about that in a little bit. But basically, Jonah, they, they, he knew about the Assyrians, he knew they were nasty people, but that was before they came and completely decimated all of Israel. So Jonah is above that red line. Nahum is after that red line. Now, Nineveh... Um, fell um, in, in 16, uh, 612 BC. So that was uh, uh, more history, but the, the, the Babylonians and the Persians and the Medes came along and, and really ransacked the, 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 the city. And that's really what Nineveh is about. It's about the punishment that God has, has um, released on Nineveh because of various things. So now, now we're thinking about Nahum, right? Nahum, he's from the northern kingdoms, so he's living in a land that's occupied by an enemy. So it's a little bit like being, uh, growing up in, in France during the Second World War, which is occupied by Germany. Yeah? Don't really like the Nazis, right? But then God gives Nahum a vision and a burden for Nineveh. So it's a bit like saying to that French guy, you must go to Berlin and preach the gospel. <laughs> right? You're kind of getting the picture a little bit about what, what, what God is giving Nahum to do. Quite weighty. So let's read Nahum. Now, I realize it's going to be a bit, a bit tricky to find it. What I tend to do with the minor prophets, I find Psalms, I find the New Testament, and then sort of move towards the New Testament until I get to about Jeremiah, move a bit more, and then eventually you get to Daniel, and then you flip around a bit until you find something. 
So, um, Nahum. So Nahum is in three parts, and I'll read them in, in, in the three chapters um, and sort of highlight a little bit little bits of things as we go. So I'll read the first one. And this is um, what they call an acrostic poem, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elikashite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds, and clouds are in the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in the times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood he makes the end of Nineveh, and he will pursue his foes into the realms of darkness." Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among the thorns and drunk from their wine, and they will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will, no more will the wicked invade you they will be completely destroyed. So an anacrostic poem is um, something that is, is memorable. It's like one letter for the alphabet um, so that you, you remember it. So it's a bit like the grand old Duke of York had 10,000 men. You know, you remember a historical event because of a song or a poem about it. Um, and this is really, in a sense, it's bad news for Assyria. God is saying, <laughs> your time has come. I preached to you um, through Jonah 100, oh, 100 or so years ago, and you haven't changed. Your time has come. But on the other hand, it's good news, because <laughs> this is the, the affliction um, that, that has been against the Israelites and, and the, um, the, the, the kingdom of Judah. Um, the Assyrians had been really, really problematic to them. So... It's a bit like saying, I'm going to kick the Nazis out. Yeah? So on one hand, it's really quite depressing. And on the other hand, it's really quite good news. So when, when they're saying, celebrate Judah, it's because you will be free. The thing that has been um, uh, oppressing you will be gone. Um, so let's have the next slide. I'll show you a couple of pictures of, of Assyria. So this is a, a, um, a particular battle. So in... Um, in the British Museum, they've got this, this, this set of, of uh, um, war sculptures. And here you can see the Assyrians basically um, uh, skinning their, their enemies. Not very friendly people. Um, and this is a particular battle, and it's the Battle of Lakshish. And this is what the, the Syrian king... Assyrian king said about that particular battle. Because Hezekiah, king of Judah, would not submit to my yoke, I came up against him, and by force of arms and by might of my power, I took 46 of his strong fenced cities, and of the smaller towns which were scattered about, I took and plundered a countless number. From these places, I took and carried off 200,156 persons, old and young, male and female, together with horses and mules, asses and camels, oxen and sheep, a countless multitude. So that's a Sennacherib 
in um, 7, 700 BC. So looking at the next slide, this is a picture of those 200,000 who were taken into exile. And the Assyrians, were, were, they did this. They came in, they took the people away, and then scattered them all over their, their empire. They displaced people. Um, and they did this to Thebes, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so let's, let's read what Nahum saw would happen to Assyria. So chapter 2. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. The shields of the warriors are red, the warriors are clad in scarlet. The metal on the chariot flashes on the day that they were made ready. The spears of juniper are brandished, the chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the squares. They look like flaming torches. They dart about like lightning. Nineveh summons her picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is put in place. The river gates are thrown open, and the palace collapses. It is decreed that Nineveh will be exiled and carried away. Her female slaves moan like doves and beat on their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless. The wealth from all its treasures. She is pl pillaged, plundered, and stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble, every face grows pale. Where now is the lion's den? The place where they feed their young lions. Where the lion and the lioness went, and the cubs with nothing to fear. The lion is kill has killed enough for his cubs, and strangled the prey for his mate, filling his lairs with the prey and his dens with prey. I am against you, declares the Lord. I'll bur burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on earth. The voices of your messengers will be heard, no longer heard. So the lion was a symbol of the Assyrians. So, so that's the last little bit is a bit figurative. What is interesting about this passage is that it's very descriptive, quite explicit. So the Babylonians had red uniforms, and that was not known in Nahum's time. Um, so he knew the color of the invading army that would actually sack Nineveh. Also, the palace was made out of mud brick. So when they, when, they, when they flooded the city, the palace literally crumbled. So these, these things that Nahum saw was actually what happened, which is quite staggering considering it was 50 years, at least, you know, so around about 50 years before it happened. So God saw, you know, it gave Nahum insight into what might happen. And, you know, uh, I'm a modern person, right, and I'll, I'll, I'll really admit to, my, to, to you right, right now that I don't like um, considering uh, things like, like war and uh, slaughter and exile and all that sort of stuff. It's not really what I find fun. But this sort of stuff is real. It's there. Um, and Partly, the, sec the third part of, of, uh, of Nahum is the reason why. So, God is not without his cause. And I think that's partly what I want to really touch on um, this, this, uh, this morning. So, let's read the last chapter, um, and then we'll start to think about what is God actually saying to us through it. And maybe we can click to the next slide as well. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears. Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of, sor alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face and will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth, I will treat you with contempt, and I will make you a spectacle. All who, flee, all, sorry, all who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile, with water all around her? 
The river was her defense, the, ri the waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her, her allies. Yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces on every street corner. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. You too will become drunk. You will go into hiding and seek refuge from your enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees, and with their first ripe fruit, when they are shaken, the figs will fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They are all weaklings. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the, ba the bars of your gates. Draw water for the siege. Stretch, strengthen your defenses. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. They will devour you like a swarm of locusts. Multiply like grasshoppers, multiply like locusts. You have increased the number of your merchants until they are more numerous than the, the, the stars in the sky. But like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away and no one knows where. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber. Your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to help them. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? So that's Nahum. And it's heavy. So my apologies for a heavy um, scripture, but I think it's important. And I think it's important because God here is described as a jealous and avenging God. So is that just for Nineveh or is that for us now? And to be honest, that's frightening. It's scary. And I want to read you something from the New Testament because, you know, sometimes we think it's just the Old Testament that's like this. Romans 1, um, and I'm not going to read all of it because otherwise we'll be here all morning um, and I'm already running late. Um, so Romans is a fascinating study on the wrath of God, and I would encourage you, please read Romans. It's important. Um, but there's a couple of things in, in this passage of Romans that I think really is reflected in what happened with Nineveh and is, is also reflected in what happens today with us. So um, Romans 1 verse 18 starts, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Sometimes we don't know or see the wrath of God. Actually, we don't see it very much. To be honest, if you look around, some of those guys out there who are, who are doing nasty things, you think, well, what, what's with that? It looks like they're not getting what they deserve. And then you see all these really, really good people, and they're suffering with all sorts of stuff. And you're thinking, that, that doesn't seem to make sense either. But this is what the scripture says, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godless and, wicked, and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. So Jonah went to Nineveh and preached the gospel. They knew about God. In fact, they, were, they, they took Jonah's message seriously. Sackcloth and ashes, they repented. They knew God. Then they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. And I think this is really fundamental to, to how we understand whether God is angry or not. Because God has created us, and I'll talk about this in a little bit about, um, to worship him and to worship him only. And when, when God says he's a jealous God, it's about that worship. And I'll, I'll hopefully explain that a bit more in, in a bit. So furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not to, uh, so, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have been f become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. By the Assyrians, 
not acknowledging God and serving him, the evil increased. And what, what, uh, what second Nahum describes is exactly what they did to another nation. So it's kind of, <laughs> in a way it's their just desserts if you think about it, but it's still, it still troubles me. It's still awkward to think, is it God who's like, nah, on them? And does that, does that resonate? Does it, is it, does it connect with the loving God that, I, that I've grown to know and trust? The one that we talk about often on Sundays. But then there's this sort of contrast. So how does it fit together? And the question really is, is God angry? And yeah, maybe let's go to the next slide. Let's have a think. The trouble with questioning God's anger is that the only example of anger we have is human. Yeah? When we think of anger, we think of, of anger that is, um, think of the words you think of anger, blind rage, seeing red. It's, they're all, it's, it's excessive. It's fickle. When I'm hungry, I get angry. God doesn't get hungry. <laughs> right? Um, also, anger, it's a, I have to check my notes otherwise. It can be excessive. And this is what, what uh, Eric Banner is like. You know, when he gets angry, nothing stops him. It's completely excessive. But God isn't like that. God has, has given us certain things about anger, which to help us to, to stem it and to control it. And this is what it says in, in 1 Corinthians. And this is a very famous passage that we read at, read, read at weddings all the time. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It doesn't say that it is never angered. It's not easily angered. So can a loving God get angry? And can an angry God still love? My contention today is that anger is not part of who God is in his character. But sin provokes God to anger. You read it again and again through the Old Testament that the Israelites provoked God to anger. And I think of, of, of the idea of jealousy. So, the most frequent thing that provoked God to anger was when the Israelites worshipped other gods. Idolatry. And for us, <laughs> we think, oh, yeah, sh it should be something more dramatic, like murder, you know. But no, it's idolatry. And this is because God is a jealous God. Let's have a look at the next slide. So God created us in his image. The, the right in the beginning, um, we, we reflect God's glory. That's the way we're supposed to work. He is completely other than us. And yet, we are reflecting him. And we reflect him through our worship. And the trouble with sin is, that it has broken that image and we can no longer reflect God's glory. And that saddens him. It saddens him, but also it makes him angry because when we don't reflect God's image, we don't love others. And the golden rule is to love God and to love one another. And he created us whole and perfect to be in relationship with one another without distrust or suspicion or selfishness. By that way, we love each other, we love God and worship him only. But because of sin, we don't love him. We don't love one another. And that upsets him. 
And it gets to the point where he just can't, he has to do something. So I think the answer to qu- the question of is God angry is yes, sadly. And that's bad news. But we have a gospel of good news, right? Because God's anger is only met in Christ. Let's have a look at the next slide. I hope that's that one. Yeah. But de- God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And God poured out his wrath on Christ. Now, it's, it's, it's something I still struggle to understand. And I've been a Christian a long time. But I don't have to necessarily understand the ins and outs of it to know that it works. Just like I don't he- need to understand how my, my digestive tract to know, to know that it works, right? Doesn't mean I don't have to ask, I don't need to probe it and ask questions and think about it, but this works. Christ has stood in our stead and taken the full anger of God. And, you know, you bring in the Trinity and your brain goes kaboom, you know. Um, but it works. And so the scriptures talk about a day of reckoning that is coming. That day is still coming. When everybody's works and idle thoughts and deeds and words will be taken into account and judged. Now as Christians, we celebrate that day because it's the day that that the new heavens and the new earth will come. And that's an exciting prospect. But in that prospect of, of rebirth and a time of no more pain and no more tears, the stuff we love to read in Revelations, there's also passages of Revelations about judgment and fear gnashing of teeth because some people have not come to Jesus and said I am a sinner and I know that I can only be right with God through you so yes God is angry but Christ has died for that to set us free from sin and death Hop onto the next slide there, Ben. Um, Skip over this one, I don't have time. (laughs) And this one as well, thanks. (laughs) Final thing. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So my plea for you today is to turn, (laughs) turn to Jesus. Because he can save us from God's anger.